Hey guys, it's Chris, the Natural Progressive. Uh, today, I am very excited to bring back um, on this channel, Derek Jensen. Of course, he's an author, he's an activist and a eco philosopher. He's done great works. If you haven't read any of his, his books, I really highly recommend Endgame and the, the Myth of Human Supremacy. Those would be fantastic reads to get an idea of who Derek is. Um, I, this is one of my heroes. I've got to say, like, of all the people I've, I've interviewed, of, of all the people that I've talked to, of all the people I've read, this is one of, somebody who has inspired me greatly. And I just really am excited to bring to you again, Derek Jensen. Say hi, Derek. Oh, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> You're very welcome. Um, so today is <clears throat> Independence Day. How are you? How patriotic are you feeling? And what is patriotism to you? Um, you know, I really love uh, the Lion song. Um, I think it's called My Country. And it's about how when he was young, he was taught how to <laughs> fold the flag and how he was taught that when bad people come that he will fight for his country and you start to think gosh this is sort of a patriot type song until about halfway through it switches to i love this land and i love my home and i love this forest and when bad people come to invade this i will fight them and i will not be fighting alone because um, because the forest will be fighting with you. And um, so when I think of patriotism, I don't actually think of countries. I don't, that's not what's so important. But what I think of is the real country, the countryside, the, the land. And of course, that has long since been invaded. And uh, and it's, it's time we fought for the land. Thank you for that. To borrow your phrase, you always say that in your interviews and I love that. Thank you for that. Yes, um, that's what I think of. And that's why I call it false patriotism, what they're celebrating right now outside, blowing off all kinds of explosives, polluting the air even more for no reason other than our own entertainment. Um, it kind of makes me sad. It, it really does. What are they? What are what are they celebrating? You know, it's the destruction of our our, our planet, our country, our our natural world. Uh, is that what they're celebrating in the big parade that Trump had? I don't, what are your feelings on that? Uh, we're going to get into the other stuff about the Green New Deal and get in, get dive deep into that. But for now, just because it's Independence Day, I just want a, a, your opinion on that. Oh. Well my opinion on fireworks, et cetera, is I hate them. And I, I don't really like loud noises myself. And I mainly hate them because um, they terrify animals. Yeah. I mean, let alone my dogs, but the natural, the animals, the wild animals and everything that have no control, don't know what's going on. Um, it has to be terrifying for them as well. When I'm seeing my dogs huddled at my feet, scared to death especially when i mean non-humans aren't stupid and they can recognize that gunshots go along with um hunting and hunting in this case involves them getting shot and um so yeah it would be it would be terrifying another thing i think about is sometimes when you know i hear all these bombs bombs there we go when i hear the fireworks going off i think about what it would be like to live in an honest to goodness war zone and when you're hearing that those sounds it's not something entertaining and fun but instead this is actually somebody's house getting blown up yeah and that's happening that's happening like right now right in several places around the world that's happening right now that's what they're um that it's destruction that they're hearing it's death that they're hearing with those booms and we're celebrating that yeah 
I mean, I don't, I don't mean to be sort of your standard environmentalist killjoy. And if we were talking about, I don't know, if we were talking about Halloween, I could talk about how candy tastes okay or something. But <laughs> July Fourth has never been has never been a big one for me. It's it's something I've never been very thrilled about. I don't really care. I don't care except for the fireworks and those actively annoy me. Yeah, I mean, when when you see the animal suffering, it's easy. I mean, when we first moved out to where we're at right now, the fireworks used to shoot off right above where our horses are, and there was a barbed wire fence. And I remember we spent that whole entire night um, keeping the horses away from the barbed wire fence. We had all my kids and, and me and my husband like chasing the horses away from the barbed wire fence because they were going off right above our house. The horses were terrified. They, they thought they were going to die, you know, and no way to escape it. So yeah, that, that was my turning point as far as fireworks go. So it was not a fun situation. Um, anyway, so let's get off of Independence Day because honestly, there really isn't much to celebrate at this at this moment. Um, I don't feel very patriotic towards our government, towards um, our situation. Here's, an, it, here's yeah. an interesting thing. I think um, patriotism, now instead of just complaining, I'll finally get to some analysis. But hey. I think patriotism is a toxic mimic of, of something very real, which is I think we have an innate, instinctual and necessary uh, urge to be part of something larger than ourselves. Humans are social creatures. And even if we weren't social creatures, Wolverines, I believe, that similar urge to be part of their larger land base. And it's not simply that they have the urge, but they but they are a part of the larger land base. Likewise, we have a, a foundational need to be part of a larger community. And capitalism has pretty much destroyed all of our communities. That's one of the things it does, but we still have a toxic mimic of something is something that takes the form and perverts the content. So a really straightforward example would be that rape takes the form of sex or making love and completely changes the, con changes the actual content and turns into something completely toxic. And we have this desire and need to be part of a larger community, but since capitalism has destroyed our communities, that loyalty has been taken away from the real communities that people have had throughout human existence and throughout social creature existence, and then attached it to these larger uh, entities that don't serve us well. And so you can get people who will die for their country. And the, that's an extraordinary thing. And, that takes this very uh, important, necessary, life-affirming uh, willingness to give one's life for one's community, which I'm not gonna ask you to do this, but I'm guessing that if necessary, you would give your life for your children, you know? Absolutely, yes. This takes that necessary thing, that necessary impulse and, and uses it in a way that does not serve us. Am I being clear at all? Yeah, yeah, I think I get your point. Yeah, absolutely. And I, honestly, and I like sports, don't get me wrong. I'm not bashing sports here, but I think the same thing happens with, we, we put our loyalty to the Denver Broncos or the, um, you know, Seattle Seahawks or whomever or whatever. And that's a fine thing, but it's it's been part of this same disconnection from what is close to us and what is real. And we should be fighting for our communities. And that includes our non-human communities. That's where our loyalty should lie. And at some point, um, and 
God, we could we could talk about this easily, but that functionally and systematically, the system has inserted itself between us and our loyalties to community and to the natural world and gotten us to make it so that we identify more with the government than we do. You know, I used to do these talks where I would ask people, do you believe the government takes better care of human beings or corporations? And not a single person out of tens of thousands ever in over the years ever said that they think the government takes better care of human beings than it does corporations. Everybody knows it takes better care of corporations. But at the same time, then we all will talk about the government as we, who's going to be our president, who's going to be, you know, how much longer do you think that we're going to be in Iraq? Like, we're in Iraq? I thought we were in Northern California. <laughs> I love that. We're going to have troops in Iraq. It's like, I got troops? Holy crap, I didn't know I have troops. If I tell them, take out the Grand Coulee Dam, will they do it? And so there's a, um, on every level, we've been co-opted into identifying with this government as opposed to... Like it's a part of us. Like it's an extension of us. I mean, right? Exactly. Exactly. Like one time, this is pretty funny. Um, several years ago, maybe, yeah, six or seven years ago, there was some TV show about the United States torture program. And my, my mom looked at me and she said, you know, it's just terrible that we torture. And I looked at her and I said, mom, you torture? I, that's horrible. And she looked at me and she said, I'm 83 years old and I'm your mother. Don't do this to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, God. You're the best sense of humor. That's, yes, but yes. We talk about point. Yes. Oh yeah, it's like the me and the mouse in my pocket, like kind of scenario, right? When we say we and all that, but yeah, we co-opt the government as, as part of ourselves. And that's just, it's such an odd thing that we do. Well, very quickly, part of the reason that we do that is because, well, there's a couple of big, big things here. One of them is that in any abusive situation, one of the most important things is for the abuser to get the victim to identify more with the perpetrator than with the, than with the victim's own self-interest. And that can be rational from the perspective of the victim because if you have an abusive father, say, um, it doesn't really matter what the children are feeling. What is important is what the father's feeling because if the father gets unhappy, that can be very threatening to them. And so they have to identify more with the perpetrator. And that's that's one of the functions of abuse is to get the victims to identify more with the perpetrator. So on one level, that's what's going on. And on another level, one of the things that this society has done systematically is, as I said earlier, insert itself between us and the natural world. And so if you ask somebody where their food comes from and where their water comes from, they will say from the grocery store and from the tap. And what that means is that you are dependent for your very life on the system that's killing the planet and right. you and to the death the system that th that system because your life depends on it if on the other hand your food came from the from the from the land and your water came from a river you would defend to the death the land and the river but the system has inserted itself between us and the ability to uh, live without it, which yeah, is- Between us and nature, like we're so separate from it. We don't see it anymore. It's not part of our lives anymore. Yeah, exactly. And, and part of this is that there was this uh, pro-slavery philosopher in 1830s who wrote to his Northern abolitionist buddy and said that there are land ownership conditions in which it's in the capitalist's best interest to own slaves or to not own slaves. And it's pretty straightforward. If there's a lot of land and not many people, then that means that uh, the people will have access to land, which means they have access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means they have access to self-sufficiency, which means that the only way they'll go to work for you is if you 
at the point of a gun. If on the other hand, you've got a lot of people and not much land, then the people don't have access to land, which means they don't have access to food, clothing, and shelter, which means they don't have access to self-sufficiency, which means that they'll go to work for you for whatever pittance and you don't have to actually put a gun on them because they'll die of starvation if they don't work for you. I think that's a very valid point and I love it when you bring that up and, and the whole idea of how taxes um, became a thing just, just to make people have to go to work instead of being self-sufficient. Absolutely. And so this happens on every level that we ended up, that we end up getting separated. Well, plus there's of course all the, uh, you know, pledging allegiance from when you're a, a, a child every day. And you know, I like watching baseball and I mean, baseball's fine, but it's like, you know, all this uh, patriotic crap that's going on during it too, that you get the entire audience singing about how great this country is. It's just an extraordinary thing. Right. It's fine if you want to have a church service, which is devoted to the church of the government, where, you know, you sing hymns to the government, that's fine. But good golly, it's everywhere, you know? You go to a baseball game to watch a baseball game. You don't go there to get indoctrinated into further uh, worship of the government. Right. Yeah. Isn't that crazy how they've they've like they've totally changed that? Like with the anthem and with with the military presence at, at sporting events, uh, they're they're glorifying war and military service to get you to want to be a part of it. Right. Your military pays for that, by the way. When the when the yeah. ball teams wear camouflage outfits on their special military day, they're not doing that for fun. They're doing that because the team's getting paid quite a lot of money by the U.S. government. I mean, those are your tax dollars at work. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's totally kind of sick and wrong because what are most of the wars fought over? It's over resources, which is only going to get worse and worse as, as the environment is destroyed, as the clean water is destroyed, as the air is destroyed. Yeah. Um, it's just going to get worse. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. So, so we already know fossil fuels are an issue and, and the solutions that, that some of the, the politicians are bringing up is the green new deal, which entails entirely changing our infrastructure onto wind, solar and uh, hydro power. Um, I really want to deep dive into each one of those, um, I don't know what research you've done. You wrote a book on it, which won't be out for another year, but let's let's um, kind of dive into these issues so maybe people can get an idea of, of why this may not be the best plan and maybe we can go into something that could possibly be a better plan. But let's just go ahead and start with solar. Well, let's, let's actually take a step back first. Okay, sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, once upon a time, environmentalism was about protecting wild places and wild beings. But over the decades, environmentalism has undergone the same transformation as happens to so many movements for justice and sanity, which is it's become yet another tool to promote capitalism. And basically, the climate change movement has ultimately less to do with saving the planet than it does with promoting certain uh, sectors of the industrial economy. And I know that that's a pretty bold claim, but let's think about it for a second, that if you the climate change movement can get 100,000 people marching in the streets of New York or Paris or Washington, D.C. And if you ask them why they're marching, they will say to save the earth. And if you ask them what are their demands, they will say we want subsidies for the wind and solar industry. And that's an extraordinary coup. I can't think of any other mass movements that, I mean, what has happened is that a lot of the environmental movement, the mainstream environmental, I'm not talking about grassroots environmentalists, 
but a lot of the mainstream environmental movement has been turned into a de facto lobbying arm of the solar and wind industries. And this is really about competing sectors of the industrial economy. We all know that the capitalist economy relies on subsidies and would collapse immediately without massive subsidies. And this is basically a fight between industrial and solar and coal and oil as to who gets those public monies. And that's what really the Green New Deal, a lot of it is, is just an attempt to get massive amounts of money for wind, solar, hydro, et cetera. And you could say, well, gosh, that's, 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 that's fine, but we don't care because, because we want subsidies for something that's going to save the planet. So the question is, will it save the planet? Right. Actually, that's not the question they ask. That's the question I ask. But the question they ask is they presume and they pretend that it will run, that, that wind, solar, et cetera, will run the economy. <clears throat> and the short answer is no. And, you know, we hear all the time that, I just saw this thing yesterday again, Sierra Club was saying that, uh, what state was it? I don't remember which state it was. Just yesterday they said that some state or another has vowed to go 100% renewable energy by, I don't know, 2050 or something. And, you know, we hear that Munich is going to go 100% renewable energy by 2025, whatever. Isn't it New York? I don't know, Sandy could answer that. I think it was New York that just declared a climate emergency and all that. Well, that's fine that they declare. I mean, okay, before I go any further, I have to say, yes, global warming is terrifying and it's yes. happening. It's, it's very, 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 very bad. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the problem, the, the, the two problems are one, that wind, solar, et cetera, can't actually run the economy, which is fine from my perspective because I don't want to run the economy. I want to save the planet. And the second is they're actually incredibly harmful to the planet. Um, but let's talk about the economy first. They, they say that they're going to go 100% renewable energy. That's not actually true. I mean, it's just a lie. And one of the reasons it's a lie is because they're confusing electricity and energy. The wind, solar, et cetera, can only generate electricity. They can't, they can't run a semi-truck. They can't run an airplane, except through batteries, which we can talk about in a minute. So when they say that Munich is going to go 100%, well, first off, when they say Munich's going to go 100% renewable, they imply that this is wind and solar. First, only 20% of energy usage is electricity. So what they're really saying is that 20% of, that they're gonna go 20% because they're not gonna replace all the trucks. They're not going to replace all the boilers in that, that's used for heating. So mainly electricity, so 80% of the energy use in Los Angeles, in New York City, it doesn't matter where, is not electricity. And electricity cannot be stored. It has to be used as it is. And so this makes a big problem right away. So one of the advantages of oil or coal to run an industrial economy is that you can get a barrel of oil and then you can just sit, have it sit there until you need it. And then you can burn it and it's reliable. On the other hand, wind and solar only work when the sun is shining or the wind's blowing, other way around. And so what do you do? How do you run a ventilator in a hospital at night when the wind isn't blowing? Batteries, and then, then you'll explain the problem with batteries. Yeah, so, so there's a problem. Yeah, okay, so, so first off, Wind, solar, etc. They they simply can't replace. I'm gonna I'm gonna get some actual numbers here. Hold on. Oh, 
Oh, well, let's back up a second. So okay. When they talk about, um, when they talk about Munich, et cetera, going 100% uh, renewable, first off, what they mean is renewable en electricity instead of energy. I already said that. But the other thing that they don't say is that the largest form of renewable energy by far in Germany, which is one of the miracles they talk about, and this is true all over, is biomass. And what biomass means is cutting down forests and burning them. Right. Or uh, growing crops like ethanol, growing corn. Yeah, for, for fuel, yeah. Those are actually way, way larger percentage. So right now for green energy, they are deforesting the American Southeast, turning it into pellets, sending it to the UK where it's burned. And that is this renewable energy miracle that they're talking about. Wind and solar are, um, I'll give you the exact numbers that is in Germany with their miracle. Um, <clears throat> okay, so primary energy consumption in Germany, um, wind is about 1.4% of total, uh, solar is about 0.8%, um, hydro is 0.5%, not 5%, 0.5%. Renewables total in Germany were about 11.5%. Uh, wow. But some of those renewables also require fossil fuels in order to. Well, that's that the next step. This is, this is all, they act like solar panels grow on trees, mm -hmm. but panels require mining for the rare earths, for the silicon, for Cabal, copper, copper, and um, they require the transportation system. There's another thing. How are you going to do global transportation with batteries? You can't. Um, the or or even with trucks. I mean, look around right now. What what? I mean, seriously, look look around, and I will too. What that you see right now was not ever carried by a truck. Nothing. Nothing. I worked in a warehouse for a short period of time. I know everything we use. Everything we need is 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 carried by a truck we're transporting way too much and i push that on my show a lot about living local like exactly. that's one of the best things you could possibly do grow your food locally exactly. and and not transport anything stop transportation altogether that's a big thing i push and thank you so much for saying that well and and that can't be done with solar because the energy density that's what i'm gonna search for and give you some actual numbers because i can just you know be saying oh this is terrible but Let's do some real numbers. Um, I think we're bumming a lot of people out right now that, that just want to believe there's an easy answer. And, okay. Yeah. Gasoline stores about 46 megajoules per kilogram. That's just an amount. It, it doesn't matter what that actually means. Mm -hmm. The important thing is we're going to compare it. 46 megajoules per kilogram, um, right now, um, lithium iron, uh, lithium batteries have about one megajoule per kilogram. And what this means is that you have to have a huge density of them. Um, and I'm gonna look up what it is for semis. Um, So diesel fuel has a density of about 48 megajoules per kilogram. As Alice Friedman, who wrote When Trucks Stop Running, Energy in the Future of Transportation, said to me, quote, a diesel semi-tractor can haul 60,000 pounds of freight 600 miles before refueling. 
to get a similar range, that tractor would have to have 55,000 pounds of batteries. Subtract the weight of batteries from the 60,000 pound total capacity, you're left with 5,000 pounds of freight. So is that, I know these are all numbers and people can be sort of number phobic, but is that, is that clear why this is, it will just never work? Um, it's not, the energy density of diesel and oil are so high that they, they're not functionally replaceable for an industrial society. Right. So what is the answer? It's just living more simply and, and going back to the, oh, wait, but there's too many people on the planet. You know, there's just, I don't know. I mean, I, I know a lot of people are, are frustrated on here. Like I am, I, I want to find an answer. I want to, to save the world. But at this point, I'm at a point where all we can do is save the natural world as much as possible. That's where I'm at. Um, I have a doctor friend who always says that the first step toward proper treatment is correct diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my problems with all of this so-called renewable energy talk is it's, it's, it's wasting time we don't have on solutions that will not work and that actually harm the planet. And yep. So the, or let's go a different direction and talk about Alcoholics Anonymous. The first step is to recognize that there's a problem. And so the first step is to recognize that there's a problem and that, you know, wind and solar won't work. They require massive mining. You know, we've heard about this guy, Mark Jacobson, who came up with a plan for how the United, how, how you could have the economy powered by just massive wind harvesting installations, um, solar harvesting installations, lots more dams. And if you actually do the math on it, this would require more mining than like more mining than all of the mining on the planet for iron for a year and a half. And so he's actually requiring additional mining, which by the way, cannot be done without fossil fuels. You can't, you can't power those, you can't run those mega trucks on batteries. It just, none of that works. No, you can't. I worked actually on a, on a mining operation for a while too. I've done, I'm a jack of all trades. I've done everything. I worked in, in the salt, um, this is Great Salt Lake. I worked for a while um, harvesting salt before I knew what, what was really going on with everything. And that's what I did. I ran the, the harvester for the salt. I ran the wash plant to wash the salt. And yeah, there's no way you're, you're gonna do that with electricity for one. Not that I want to do that. I wanna stop all that. That's just, it was destructive. There was a, all the water they used for that turned, went into this canal and turned into sludge that they said, if you fell into that, you were dead instantly. I mean, that's what we're doing to the planet. And this is I, I've seen it firsthand. And this is what's happening, for example, with rare earths mining for solar, for all of our electronics, that most of that is done near Baotou, China. And uh, that area has been turned into a giant wasteland with a toxic lake that you can see from outer space. It's, it's. Yeah. And then there's a copper mine that's here in Utah that you can see from outer space, Kennecott Copper. And it's, it, it eaten, it's eaten up a whole entire mountain. And yet you want to keep mining for more copper, keep destroying more habitat for other animals while we're adding 250,000 people per day to the planet and destroying 250 species every single day of other life? Of course, I agree with you. And mm -hmm. so we have part of the problem is that we, we were talking about we earlier, Mm -hmm. so we, yeah. we collectively are solving for the wrong variable. The variable, I mean, what do all of the so-called solutions to global warming have in common? What they all have in common is they take industrial capitalism as a given and the natural world is having to conform to industrial capitalism. Right. And that's literally insane in terms of being out of touch with physical reality because without the natural world, you have no social system whatsoever. So whatever social system we have must be secondary to the health of the natural world. That's the only way to make a sustainable society. And 
but it's God. Okay, I just had this conversation with with um, a family member who called me today, and and this is why I'm all discombobulated and probably not on my best game at the moment. Um, I was told that it's all in God's plan, and 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 this was predicted to happen in the Bible and is happening exactly the way the Bible intended. So if you have people that are believing in that kind of a scenario, how on earth are you going to get anyone to understand that the natural world is important? Um, that's why I wrote Endgame, because mm -hmm. before I wrote Endgame, I would ask people at talks, do you believe that we will undergo a voluntary transformation to a sane and sustainable way of living? Nobody ever said yes. Right. So if you don't believe that we're going to undergo a voluntary transformation to a sane and sustainable way of living, and you care about the natural world, what does it mean for your strategy and for your tactics? And my point is that if somebody thinks that this is God's plan and they think that if they attempt to suggest that what is happening is okay, they're actually not going to be on my side. Right. And I'm not, I'm not slamming. You said that was a relative. Yes. Okay. I'm not slamming that relative of yours. Cause I got relatives just like that too. Yeah. I wanted to know about that too. That's one thing I really wanted you to talk about. How do you deal with that? Yeah, go ahead. Well, a question that I have gotten a lot at, um, talks and this, this, this surprised me. I never would have expected to get this question, but I've gotten a ton is what do you talk about at Thanksgiving with family and football? Like, <laughs> Stupid stuff, the weather, right? The weather. You know, I just, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to fight that with people. Okay. Here's something that happened that, that I, I did 30 years ago that really taught me a lesson. I went to some sort of forest service meet and greet and where they're rationalizing clear cuts, et cetera. And I got in a big fight with this guy uh, who was not a forest service person. He was just another person who came to the meet and greet fight. It's not a fight. It was an argument. And we were arguing about clear cutting. I'm saying it's bad. He's saying it's good. The guy owned a drive-in theater. I spent like two hours arguing with this guy. And then when I got home, I realized this didn't matter at all. It didn't matter if I convinced him or if he convinced me because neither one of us are decision makers. It's, right. I just wasted two hours. So if, if I start to have a conversation that starts to go south in one of those situations, just change the subject. And that's another thing. I remember reading a long time ago, it takes someone 10 years to change their mind. Mm -hmm. I was very strongly uh, against um, however you want to say it, against a woman's right to choose an abortion and against abortion. He was, you know, well, you, whatever language you want to use. And then about 10 years later, he found himself arguing very strongly the other side and he had never actually realized he changed his mind. It's just natural it, evolution evolving. Yeah. Yeah. The same has happened with me that, you know, I argue very strenuously in favor of co cooperation being a primary mover of, evolution, I got introduced to that by reading John Livingston. And when I first read it, I thought, God, this guy's crazy. That makes no sense whatsoever. And it took me about three or four years before that transition took place. So what I'll do is I'll just sort of drop, I just sort of say my piece. If somebody starts to argue, like, okay, great. We'll talk about something else and just, just sort of drop, plant a seed. I just plant some seeds and that's it. It's kind of hard when you, when I have a channel and then they go and watch my channel and that's what spurred it on. Well, in that case, what I tell them is great. You make your own channel and you can push whatever you want there. Oh, that's great. I should, I should say that. Oh God. I said <laughs> people write to me and say, you know, you shouldn't say this in your book and you shouldn't say that in the book and you should say this instead. I always just write back to them and say, Hey, that's a great idea. Why don't you write a book? <laughs> that's fantastic. I well, love that me a long time to get there I, there were many times in between where i would curse at them but hmm. it's, like, it's like yeah you do your own thing um but the other thing the other response i have to all that is oh this is god's will okay what if i were to say to you that um it's, it's god's will and don't worry i'm not going to do this but what if i said to you what if i grabbed your kid and i took a 
a knife and I put it to your kid's throat and I said, you know, it's God's will that I kill your kid. People would think you are freaking nuts. You are crazy. Exactly. And they would stop you. Mm -hmm. But they're doing the same thing to the planet. Exactly. There is a knife up against the throat of the planet and they're saying it's God's will. That's. But it's not God's will. It's actually the result of choices. Yeah. And that's the real point. They're not taking responsibility for it. Instead, religion is is an excuse um, to not take responsibility for it. In exactly, it bothers me a lot. I stay up. At, I I I can't sleep at night because of that. That thought. It's there are plenty of people who give non-religious arguments that are basically the same. They will say, you know, humans evolved so that because the Earth really wanted to die. I actually get that one. Oh, really? That's insane. Oh, I know. I know. Absolutely. We're, we're going to take some questions really soon here, just so you know. Um, I really wanted to get through so much more, but I know I can have you on again, right? Yeah. We'll do it again. Because we haven't even started the, uh, we've, we've barely touched the whole solar wind thing. We haven't talked about bat or bird kills. We haven't talked about the fact that right. dams actually produce more uh, greenhouse methane. Gases. Yeah, methane, right? Because of the decomposing material when they dam it up and everything, yep. right? Yep. So it's actually, they call them methane bombs or methane factories because it's actually worse. Dams are actually worse. Even ignoring the fact that dams kill rivers, just from a greenhouse gas perspective, dams are actually worse than coal. I'm not arguing for coal. Oh, no. so take questions. I want to just say quickly. So some okay. of the solutions. So first off, we need to recognize that the earth is primary. And uh, that it is more important than the economy. And um, there are, yes, there are more people on the planet than the planet can support. I could reduce population with a non-draconian fashion really easily, which is give women absolute reproductive freedom. Oh, yes. You know what? I have my own story on that. And I tell it all the time. I tell it often about how I wasn't allowed to have my tubes tied when I was 23. And they wouldn't do it until I had three children. And, and I never wanted children. If, if I would have had that opportunity, and I think they should actually incentivize you not to reproduce at this point, but you know, that would be, that would be huge. Yeah, go ahead. I didn't might mean to cut you off. This is really important to me. It's like heartfelt, it's, it, it hurts me to think about it, but go ahead. 50% of the children who are born right now are not actively wanted in the world. Yeah. And. Um, so we could solve overpopulation really easily. Just give women absolute reproductive freedom. All we have to do with that to, to stop that is a get rid of the monotheistic Abrahamic religions and uh, patriarchy, and uh, also the capitalist growth imperative. No problem. Um, yeah, just yeah, we could do that. Simple, right? That's super that's easy to do. That's one thing. Is so we could. Another is that. As I said earlier, capitalism is run on subsidies. And right. We're giving subsidies to the wrong places, that's for sure. Yeah. So, you know, honestly, if they made me, I mean, I recognize industrial civilization can never be sustainable. But if they made me dictator, I wouldn't say, okay, let's get rid of all cars tomorrow. What I would do is have a gradual descent where we take, for example, right now, the world's commercial fisheries are subsidized to a greater value than their catch. So basically, people are being paid to destroy the oceans. So mm-hmm. just pay these people to stay at home in their underwear and watch the prices right, you know, but the world would be better off. It would be absolutely paying people to stay home. And they're also subsidizing all the oil companies and all the monoculture farming and and all of that, they're getting subsidies while the people that are doing the good things are not getting subsidies. So just take subsidies from, for example, the military and put them toward repairing riparian zones, Mm -hmm. removing dams or um, reforestation. So that's that's the first thing. But the other thing that I wanna say is, um, yes, it is a climate emergency. And yes, carbon emissions have to be reduced by 80% 80% immediately. That's so here's a whole nother thing. So we, we could go into a whole show about this too. Oh God, I know. They talk about recycling being going to save the world, and how we can just recycle all the metals. The problem is that the growth economy is continuing. And as long as you have an economy growing, you can't have 
I mean, let's forget all the problems with metals recycling. There are problems with it. We're going to leave those aside for a day because we're on time. But as long as you have a growth economy, you're going to need more new mines. So the, the, the truth is that the economy has to contract. And if they made me in charge of the economy, I would get rid of easy things first. Oh, like right now, a very small thing is that in Massachusetts, they are um, trying to pass a law that says that there will be no more logging on uh, state park lands or state lands. And one of the reasons they're doing that, I mean, there's many reasons they're doing it, that's great. There are some environmental organizations who are opposing it because that will harm uh, some meadow nesting birds. And they wanna cut down forests to make more habitat for those birds. So great, I think the birds need more habitat, but don't take it out of the forest, convert a parking lot to a meadow. Yeah, or but, convert parking lots to growing food. I mean, there's so many things. Quit allowing lawns. Stop yeah. allowing lawns. Lawns are ridiculous waste of space. Exactly. So the, the point I want to really get to is... Okay, then we'll have some questions just so you know that I'm starting to get some questions rolling in and I really want to get to them as okay. well. But go I'll, ahead. Yeah. Two, two minutes real quickly. That okay, cool. I do actually have some solutions to carbon sequestration. Okay. Seagrass sequesters lots of carbon. Um, restoring grasslands restore, uh, sequesters lots of carbon. Okay, first off, reduce, reduce carbon emissions. Yes, obviously yeah. we have to do that. And second, um, restore, 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 restore. Restore forests, forests sequestered lots of carbon. Grasslands, tons of carbon. Mangrove swamps, lots of carbon. Wetlands. Wetlands, yeah, which also filters our water. It's the largest entity yeah. that filters our water naturally. So, so. so basically stop destroying the planet. The way to stop destroying the planet is to stop destroying the planet. Simple as that. Simple, simple as that, actually. But the problem is you can't do it and maintain an industrial economy that is, you cannot have an, an economy that consumes the planet and a planet. So and the, you can't continue to grow the population of humans that take habitat from everything else. No, you can't. I mean, this, this way of life is based on stealing from everyone. You know, humans lived where I live now for at least 12,500 years. And the population was actually kind of high in this county. I think the population now is about 30,000 in this county, 40,000 maybe. And I think the population prior to conquest was about 15,000. So it's not like everybody had to starve to death. They did this because there was so much salmon. And this was actually a pretty easy place to live because, because of the salmon and the lamprey. And, and there were other places with a much lower population density. The Great Plains had a very low population density, for example. Mm -hmm. But the more food available, the, the greater the population becomes it's so, just a so, thing, right? <laughs> so the point is that they did this. They lived here without destroying the planet. Did they have automobiles? No. Did they have refrigerators? No. Did they have lots of food? Yes. And so mm -hmm. what we need to do, long story short, make the planet primary. And then everything else after that is technical. Everything will fall into place if, if, if that becomes our lifeline, if we decide that is, is what gives us life instead of some magical sky daddy that, yeah. that maybe will we'll take the planet seriously and take care of the planet. And then we'll, and then we'll make the city, we'll, we will make, okay, here's the thing too, is so many people say, you know, Indians affected their land base too. It's like, that's true, but you make different land use decisions if you're planning on living in place for the next 500 years right so make land use decisions as though if you're if you're excuse me planning on living there for the next 500 years you're not going to dig up a mountain to make copper right and you're not going to toxify you know make water that's so toxic that if you fall on it you're dead that's that's just that's just stupid exactly oh my gosh I, man i i i could just talk to you forever you know that um i appreciate you so much let's get to some questions because okay. This, this show is all about giving the other people a voice and a chance to ask people questions that they can't talk to, um, although they probably want to. So I'm um, going to get to the questions really fast. Oswald Spangler, is Derek familiar with Pinti Lincola? I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. The Finnish fascist ecologist. And if so, does he think that eco-fascism could be in danger of ensnaring the climate movement in Europe? Um. No, I'm not particularly, uh, 
I've heard of the guy, but I don't know uh, much about him. And I don't think that ecofascism is in danger of ensnaring the climate movement in Europe because I think the, ca the capitalism controls the, the... Capitalism controls everything at this moment. It controls pretty much everything. Yeah, all the money involved for sure. Yeah. Okay. Ah, no, don't go away. Question. Let me make sure I have the right question. Okay. Um, as Shiva, mainstream scientists are telling governments of the world that people of Earth must stop all greenhouse gas emissions by the end of 2030. Do you envision this happening? <laughs> Maybe. Do I envision it happening voluntarily? No. Right. Um, I completely agree that greenhouse, the greenhouse gas emissions. See, that's one of the things that bugs me is that there's even a controversy about this. I got a degree in physics in 83. And then when I was a junior, so 82, uh, I took a class on solar heating and cooling. And we talked extensively about global warming. You know, this was, this was not a controversy back then in the scientific community. And right can see people back in the 50s who are very clear on this and we've understood the mechanism since the, since the 19th century at least and it's just part of my problem honestly is that i despair of human sentience i, I i'm not entirely sure <sighs> yeah I, I i know i know that we can make some really cool gadgets like these computers, but I just, I, 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 it's not a human problem. It's a cultural problem, but I think we've, we have sold our souls to the machines and we actually serve the machines instead of the machines serving us. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's we the thing. We sold ourselves to the culture. Like, yeah, that's more important than, than what gives us life is the culture. And so do I, yes, I agree. Carbon emissions need to be stopped as soon as possible. And we're talking about life on the planet. So carbon emissions need to be stopped really. I mean, here's how I, here's how I think about it. If two ways to think about it. one is if the space aliens came down from outer space and they were doing what capitalism were do, was doing to the planet, we would know what to do. We right. would, oh gosh, if they power their machines by solar instead of diesel, everything will be fine. We would we would stop them. And the other way to, to look at this is if you weren't one of the beneficiaries, you and I and everybody listening to this weren't primary beneficiaries of this way of life. If we were, for example, Delta smelt or blue whales or coho salmon or Pacific lampreys or redwood trees, and we could take on human manifestation, how would we act? Do you think desert tortoises would, would say, great, Let's put in solar panels in the desert. No, they wouldn't. Oh, so no. I mean, that's the problem. Okay, this, sorry, Derek, I don't mean to interrupt. I really don't. But one of the comments I get on my channels when I'm talking about preserving habitats and all that and, and cutting population of humans, the, the biggest comment I get that just drives me nuts is that there's plenty of, of habitat out there that's, or plenty of land that's uninhabited is what they say. And, and I'm sorry, but there never was and never will be uninhabited land, livable, uninhabited land. Inhabited, inhabitable, you know, uninhabited, that's never happened. I mean, it may be in, inhabited by something that's not human, but it is definitely inhabited. Yes. And there is no surplus in nature that right. every, every salmon that you or I eat is a salmon that a bear can't eat right. and that an eagle can't eat and that, that, that won't reproduce. And I'm not saying we shouldn't eat. I'm just saying, don't pretend that if you cut down a forest and turn it into pellets and send them to the UK to be burned, don't pretend that that didn't harm anybody. Right. Okay, another question. Yeah, I agree 100%. And I think people need to think about that. Um, Chris Foster, hi, Chris, all the way from over the pond. Um, does Derek think the system has to collapse before these changes can take place? And if so, what will replace it? Um, 
Yes, I think that this, I would love it. Every cell in my body wants for us to have a voluntary transformation to a sane and sustainable way of living. Every cell in my body wants for, and we could do that if we weren't collectively crazy, but yeah. it's, it's not gonna happen. And so yes, it will take the collapse of the system for us to change. And then it will take a long time after that. It's, it's as someone says, uh, things are gonna get worse before they get worse. <laughs> You know, I, this is one reason why I am so strong in defense of women in all of my talks, because when patriarchal civic society collapses, men often take it out on women. And the time for women to learn self-defense and the time for men to make their loyalty to women absolute is now. It's not after collapse. I mean, I think sort of a Mad Max world is probably somewhat what we're going to get for a while. And I'm not, I don't look forward to that. I'm not saying that at all. No, who wants that? I mean, we, we're so comfy, you know. Wish. I <laughs> wish, again, we would have a voluntary transformation. Mm -hmm. Me too. Me too. But I, I'm I, trying I, to convince people of that, but it's not working. <laughs> it's happening. And... Mm. Uh, was World War III considered a voluntary change of the system? That's from Book Hermit. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and people say that you need a World War III type of response to what's going on, right? You know, and I agree with the environment. Yeah. If we devoted all of our energy to reforestation, uh, um, then I would not be. I would not be as pessimistic as I am. Um, yeah, me too. As Shiva says, we need women to lead the world and nourish again. Well, like mothers, like you always talk about mothers being very protective and being attacked by um, mothers of every every different types of animals, you know. And and I think that's true to an extent. Uh, not that all mothers are perfect or or even care about the environment, but if we cared about the planet, like we care about our children, I mean, but there's a lot of caring that needs to be happening and it's not. And we're systematically trained. I mean, this is part of the problem with patriarchy is that we are turned. Okay, I'm gonna say something controversial here, but give me, give me a couple sentences to explain it. Okay. There is a sense in which the primary victims of patriarchy are men. Okay, I'm not saying that men are the central victim, the central victim are women, the central victims are the world, yes. But it's another definition of primary, which is first. And before you can have patriarchy, you have to have army of men who've lost, who've had their empathy destroyed in order to perpetrate patriarchy. And so not the central victims, the central victims again are women. The first victims have to be men because they have to be, have their empathy destroyed so that they can go out and become the abusers of the next generation. And That's so, almost derived by culture, the culture we have where men have to be tough and... Yes, and so, again, I wanna be very, very clear that it's only in that second definition that mm -hmm. the, the primary victims, the real victims of this culture are women, are non-humans, are the entire planet, but before you can do that, you've got to assemble an army. So men have to be taught to have their empathy destroyed. Right. But Cumber says women can cause just as much trouble as men. Silly to think otherwise. No, it's it's true that women can. It's just uh, the general culture has affected men and women. Um, I mean, I don't know. Maybe you can answer that better than I can. Well, first off, right now, 90% of violent crime is done by males or 90 some percent. And mm -hmm. um Women, are, men are generally trained to be, uh, to be warriors. And um, so, okay, I won't if you don't want me to. Am I allowed to? Uh, am I allowed to swear on this? It's you okay. can swear as much as you want. Okay, so Gail Dines has this great line about how within patriarchy, men are trained to say and enact "fuck you," and women are trained and. and and trained to, to enact, fuck me. So women are trained to be open and inviting. 
men are trained to be tough and hard and go after. And I'm not saying that's natural. I'm not saying that's inherent. I'm not saying it's biological. I'm saying that- It's our culture. It's the culture. It's what patriarchy does. And Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that there aren't bad women. Of course there are. Um, Just read about a woman yesterday who, in California, who uh, drowned two of her children. Um, And I mean, yeah, so women commit crimes, but, but- that's not what patriarchy is about. Anyway, um, back to the original point. Yes, I think it will require collapse. I wish it didn't. And, um, and I think from the natural world's perspective, the sooner that collapse happens, the better. I think that if I were a blue whale or a right whale or a American pika or a sequoia, I'd be going, can't happen. I wish it would have happened several thousand years ago. Passenger pigeons probably wish it would have happened 200 years ago. Oops, look behind me. Do you see? <gasps> Oops. Oh I my get... gosh, yes. Oh my what? gosh. That there is so freaking cool. Do you guys see that? Oh my God. There is a bear. Two. Outside his door, there's two. Okay. There's All right, one. the other one's kind of hidden there. Okay. There's one in the corner of the tree and there's another one. That uh, is amazing. Oh my God, you are so lucky to see that. Every like every day of your life to see the bears to walk with the bears. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Your dogs aren't going crazy yet. They're asleep. Okay. Oh, Let them sleep. Mine are t- sleeping too. Do you see my puppy behind me? I can't yeah. say I can't say the B word or they will get up and start yelling. I know what you're talking about though. Oh my gosh, they're so beautiful. I love nature. <laughs> we need to save that. Save that. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. I am so happy that happened while you were on with me. That makes me so like giddy inside. I mean, how much time do we have to see that kind of a thing, you know? Time is fleeting. Anyway, oh my gosh. So we're at an hour. I, if you have more to say, I am more than willing to let you talk um, because, you know, you're kind of one of my heroes. So <laughs> I don't see any more questions that are addressed. Oh, wait. Human wants me to ask if, if anyone else has questions. Okay, last chance for a question for Derek. Yeah, let's do like five more minutes and quit. Okay, sounds good. Um, so Daniel, Gary, he, you had a question earlier and I, it's way too far up for me to, to get it. So if you want to ask it again, that would be fantastic. Um, I don't see, come on guys, hurry and type. <laughs> it takes a second to type. So, uh, was, Sandy from Environmental Coffee House says she I, I screenshot the best shot of this so she got the bear in her but the bear is still there over your shoulder oh my god that is amazing to me uh I think he is approving of Derek Daniel says he didn't think of the question but anyway bears here too they're everywhere I guess well that's cool there's not bears here I, I would love to see a bear in the wild. The only place I've ever seen one in the wild was in Yellowstone. So, um, or high desert. There's not a lot of bears. There's cougars, but not a lot of bears. I've never seen a mountain lion. I haven't, I've not seen in the I've wild. Never- They're shy. They're super shy. There's a ton of them up here, but I've never seen one. I've seen remnants of, I've seen their tracks. I've seen <laughs> their dens, but I've never actually seen one. They're just super shy which makes me sick when people hunt them with the dogs and stuff. That just makes me super sad what they ever do. You know, that bear is trying to unlock the door there. Uh, <laughs> I know he just keeps putting his paws up there. <laughs> they, did you see that video of the bear that was locked in the car and they had to let it out? Did you see that? That was pretty cute. <laughs> it was. Like, like, you know, last, how did they get in there? Bears are smart, man. Last year I had last year, two years, no, two years ago. I, um, had to keep replacing my tires because uh, there was a baby, you know what, who uh, did like to chew on them. And after three, the first time I thought, oh, that's kind of cute. And then that's 60 bucks a piece or 80 bucks a piece for tires. It, they got old pretty quickly. So I had to make some uh, uh, nail strips basically, and then put nail strips on the outside of, of, the car so they couldn't get at it. Okay, I see we got another question. So should I answer yes. this one? Yes, go ahead. So question, what domino does Derek want to see fall first? So if I were in charge, like you said earlier about lawns, I would start with um, 
completely unnecessary things. As much as I like sports, I would get rid of uh, retractable stadium roofs. I would get rid of uh, golf courses. I don't like golf anyway. Um, I would get rid of things that are completely, like you said, lawns. I would start with the stuff that's painless. Hmm, that's totally painless. How hard is it to get rid of lawns? So, and if you want a, a place for your kids to play football, you can keep, you can keep some grass in a park, you know? Mm -hmm. Have a, have a community park where kids can go and run around on the regular grass if they want, the, the non-native grass. Um, so Daniel, I, Gary has his question back up, so yeah, when you're yeah. done with that one. I would get rid of jet skis. I would get rid of off-road vehicles. So start with the easy stuff and then start moving closer and closer to home pretty quickly because it's such an emergency. Um, but start oh, with yeah. the stuff. Yes, absolutely. Do you see Daniel's question, Daniel Gary? Uh, he says, I don't know how to tag you, but I'm wondering Derek's thoughts on collapsing industrial civilization that he's expressed before. I'm not sure what he's... Oh, yeah, I'm not sure what the question is. But there, did you see the report on um, industrial civilization, human civilization collapsing by 2050? I, we can just go with that. That's not soon enough. That's not soon <laughs> enough for the 200 species who went extinct today and tomorrow. Right. The 200... 250 i i thought it was what, everything. yeah it's all it's all estimates um yeah so what i want people to do is to find what you love and then defend it and no matter what you love it's under assault whether that is free speech honestly or whether it is um women's rights or whether it is specific places or specific wild species or whatever it is you know that's the thing is when i talk about bringing down civilization that's really desperation speaking because mm -hmm. if we had enough people the, the, the big distinction is not between those who want to bring it all down and those who don't the big distinction is between those who get off their butt and do something and those who don't and which doing something can include this, it can include, it can include propaganda, it can include you doing your show, that's doing something. And I hope so. <laughs> it takes a lot of time and I'm trying to get word out and, and try to make people educated a little bit. So what I really want for people to do is something. Mm -hmm. Me too. I want you to also ask the land what it needs. If you ask the land what it needs, it will tell you. Um, just ask and, and sit with it and and then and you'll you'll have an answer and then yeah. and then do it yeah nature is 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 very good at community communicating to you if you just go and sit with it and and listen i i think i mean that's my only peace my only quiet my own only sanctuary is sitting with nature or with my horses or with my puppies right and right now i'm their sanctuary because they're afraid of booms <laughs> Oh, well, but Dean, thank you so much, Derek. I don't see, I'm, I might be, I always find questions later, but I am going to have Derek on again. I, we, there's so much more to talk about and I really, really can't wait to do that. I mean, it's never soon enough for me. Uh, it's hard to get our schedules together, but when we can, we will. Uh, this worked out great because this is how I want to be celebrating Independence Day. That's great. <laughs> so. <laughs> Day should be independence from the corporate state. Yes. Perfect. Rating well said. From this culture. Yes, absolutely. So hang out for one second. I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. And everyone, remember, I am interviewing Jordan Cheriton on the water issues um, on Wednesday at 430 Mountain. I will yeah, be here with Jordan Cheriton. So you guys, you all have a very good day. And thank you so much for joining us. And we're just going to run the intro real or the exit real quick. Derek and I just want to talk to you for one more second.